Wow, that is such an epic entrance. <laughs> good morning, everyone. <laughs> the future is bright. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, hey, my name is Joe. Um, I'm a pastor here. If I haven't had the chance to be able to meet you, it is good to be able to be with you today. Um, we have a fun message for uh, you, or at least I have a fun message for you all this morning. And, and before I start, I'd like us to pray, and I'd like us to be able to, um, to dig in together. Um, so would you, would you pray just one more time with me, and then we'll just keep going. Hey, God, thank you so much for uh, this church family. Thank you for what you're doing here, and thank you for the joy that it is to be together. Thanks for the opportunity to be able to enter into the mission that you have given us, and thank you for what uh, you have in store for us this morning. May we hear from you today. And may it change us, uh, not just today, but also tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when Caitlin and I stepped off the plane for the first time coming here to San, Anto San Antonio, um, I remember hearing the overhead announcement saying, like, welcome to Military City, USA. You all have heard that before? Yeah. Well, I love and have appreciated the undertone, the, the identity that San Antonio has. Um, that whole mission-driven identity is integrated within the entirety of this culture. I mean, even just thinking about like USAA, right? Or should I say, because it is football season, USAA, right? Okay, done. All right, so like it's, we're ready to serve. That's your mission. Like an HEB, yes, the cult. I mean, the mission, uh, HEB, the um, shoot, uh, mission, which is the mission really to making each and every person count. And I love their vision statement. If you don't know it, it's we're in the people business. We just happen to sell groceries. And I actually like it. I'm getting into it. So, hey, we work best when we're propelled by that clear mission, the clear why behind our work. And Jesus, he was like this. See, Jesus was motivated by a clear mission. In Luke 19, 10, it says, uh, this is what Jesus says. He says, like, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And Jesus, he invites you and me being a part of the church, his followers, into a clear mission. It's called the Great Commission. See, Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, look, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. See, here at Cibolo, the future is bright if we join Jesus in his great commission. And if this is true, then it's important for us for you, for me to ask and then to analyze, are we on mission with Jesus today? See, early on in following Jesus, my mission was definitely me-centric. It wasn't Jesus-centric. And I still need to check my motivations regularly. See, the temptation of a me-centered way of following Jesus is real, right? Like, if it's easy for me, then I will act nicely to others sometimes. And then if, it's, if, if it works for me, I'll attend on Sundays. If it works and it's convenient for me, I'll give a few of my dollars. But the challenge with that is it leads to this consumeristic view of following Jesus. See, Jesus should satisfy me, not make me sacrifice. He should keep me safe, not expect me to suffer. Following Jesus should only cost me a little not cost me my life. And slowly this way of following Jesus, it actually it leaves us insecure because your identity is centered on yourself, not on what he thinks of you. It leaves us irrelevant to the surrounding world because you're focused on yourself, not on giving away to others. And honestly, man, it leaves us completely ill-equipped to be able to fulfill this great commission that Jesus has given to us. See, the future of Sibylla won't be bright if we have a me-centric mission. But Jesus invites us into something more. 
See, when we are fueled by Jesus's great commission, it results in the equipping, the mobilization and the multiplication of the church. So then it begs the question of, well, how do we accomplish this mission? Well, I remember first wrestling with that question and, oh, talk about insecurity and uncertainty and feeling outside of my comfort zone. I mean, maybe you have wondered, like, how do we do this thing called church? Like, how do we do this thing practically about following Jesus? Like, what is it to actually be a disciple of him? And how do I actually give that away to someone else? Recently, in my life group, we've been walking through the book of Acts, and I couldn't help but wonder if the disciples felt similarly. In Acts 1, the disciples, they're sitting with the, at the feet of the resurrected Jesus. And I imagine them contemplating like, I saw this man die. And now I'm having lunch with him. I'm confused. <laughs> like, I, I imagine Mark turning to Peter saying, do you see what I'm seeing? Like, is this, this is Jesus. Like, he's alive. Like, if I were them, I've had so many questions. Like, now what? Like, are we going to go gain political power? Uh, yeah, let's overthrow Rome. Let's bring in that kingdom of heaven. Like, but Jesus's plan is so much bigger than anything having to do with politics. See, for three years, he'd been equipping them for something greater. Jesus was preparing them to be able to usher in the heavenly kingdom that would have earthly consequences. See, his followers, his apprentices, his disciples, they were going to be conduits and carriers and catalyzers of this heavenly kingdom advancement. That's why he says in Acts 1.8, he's going to want them to be a disciple. Oh, and we're going to end up going back. And he says this, get it. And he says, look, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then to the remotest parts of the earth. He's, gonna, he's invited us to be and to make disciples. And today I want us to remind us of our mission of the Great Commission. And to equip us with some very key practical steps that we can take together as we seek to fulfill what Jesus has commanded us. And as we explore this, I want us to remember that the disciples weren't equipped overnight. And neither was Jesus. See, even Jesus' equipping took a long time. And God wants you, he wants I to succeed in the mission that he's given to us. And he's gifted you. And so now he wants to equip you. So let's start by looking at how God equipped Jesus. See, that sounds odd, but remember, Jesus was both God and man. We're not talking about that today. We can later, but he needed to be equipped in the mission, the method, and the multiplication. Remember last week, Paul, he ended up introducing us to the Jewish uh, education system where children would go and memorize the whole Torah. They would learn to be able to read their Bibles, learn how to pursue God. And in Luke 2.52, we learned that Jesus, he grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. So he too, he went to school. He was taught by the rabbis or the pastors of the day. I mean, he was so committed to learning about the Torah that Jesus gave his mom, Mary, a heart attack, right? Like when she was like, we're leaving the festival of Passover and we can't find Jesus. Where is he? Oh, he's with the rabbis again. Like, remember, he was like, they were, they were trying to find him. See, Jesus was doing it because he, he knew that he had to learn and understand who he was. And here we, we found out that Jesus, he learned from the Bible who he was supposed to be, what he was supposed to do, and how he was supposed to go about it. And so, Jesus, I want you to turn with me to Luke 4, 16 through 22, if you have your Bibles. And I want you to see that Jesus starts his whole entire ministry. And he does it with a declaration of his mission and his vision. See, when he started his ministry, he went up to this town of Nazareth where he grew up. And there, <clears throat> he was the Sabbath day where they would all gather in the synagogue, just like we are doing right now. 
And he took out the scroll of Isaiah. He opened it up. It was this big old scroll. It wasn't nice and on your phone like y'all are doing right now. And he had to open it up and he spread it all out. And then he found the one place that he was looking for. It was in Isaiah, Isaiah 61. And here is what Jesus ends up reading. He ends up reading this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant, he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, look, today, today, this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at, him, at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. See, Jesus' ministry had started off with this bang. He left everyone speechless because like all these hearers would have known exactly what he was doing because they too studied the scriptures. They too knew that this was the Messiah's mission. They knew what this passage meant. And Jesus was saying, I am he, I am the Messiah. So let's dive in. Let's see what this, this messianic mission is all about. See, the first movement that we end up seeing here, it's in three separate movements in the book, in Isaiah, when we end up looking at it. In the first movement, it all reveals that the Messiah's relationship with the Father, it taught Jesus as he learned and studied the scriptures that he was to be with the Father. He was communing with him. The Spirit's on me. I'm with the Lord. He's given me purpose. It taught him how to be with God. And then the second movement, it reveals what the Messiah is to become like. It taught Jesus to become a servant of God. And then the third and final movement in this passage that Jesus reads, it teaches him that he is to fulfill the mission of proclaiming the good news and equipping others to do the work of the Lord. And all three of these movements, they build on each other. Like Jesus was to learn how to be, how to become, and how to do the work of the Messiah. It was his mission and it shaped everything that he did. So let's take just a little bit deeper look at this. Because before Jesus does anything, I find it interesting that the Messiah is just with God. See, we are always influenced by those who are around us. We pick up character traits, interests. We become like the people we're around. And Jesus was the same. See, we learned last week that, that the lost and the hurting are close to the heartbeat of the Father. And now, Jesus, being with God the Father, begins to pick up the same heartbeat. Jesus' heartbeat and God's heartbeat become one. So God, Jesus would have known that when God looked at the world, he saw their pain, saw their problems, saw the challenges of their life. Not just materialistically, but relationally, spiritually. And God, when we see God all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, what do we see but God of compassion? He hears our cries of the broken hearts. He sees that our need for comfort is true and real. He knows our pain, our need for support, for someone to be able to come up alongside us and to help us. And just like God, Jesus' heart begins to beat with him. And God passes on and Jesus catches God's heartbeat for the lost and the hurting. And so God, he sends Jesus to live out that mission centered on telling people the gospel, the good news and inviting people into those authentic relationships where they can be healed, redeemed, renewed 
And the Holy Spirit's in on it too, right? Like the Holy Spirit, he's with it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. So Jesus, he has the same power that he gives to you and me today. He has the Holy Spirit's power to be able to actually fulfill this, not just looking at himself for his own personal power, but instead being dependent fully on the Holy Spirit himself to be able to fulfill these things. Because to do heavenly things, we need a heavenly power. That's the Holy Spirit. The Father, he anoints him. He sets Jesus apart for this task at hand. And in Luke 4, 21, Jesus says, today, this scripture, it's being fulfilled in your hearing. And then Jesus, he obeys the Lord's instructions. And it all begins by being with God. Out of being with God, he ends up catching his heartbeat. See, the more that we spend time with God, just being with him, being with Jesus, getting into the word, learning about him, man, then we catch his heartbeat. So then look at me, look with me about how, how Jesus equipped, was equipped to be able to become or to be able to embody the Lord God, the father. Remember, Jesus eventually would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Well, here's what happens. Look at uh, in Isaiah 61, we end up seeing that this is what he was to do. He was, he sent for a specific purpose to, to bind up the broken hearted, proclaim freedom, release from others from darkness, proclaim. And then he skips over the bad part, which is to proclaim year of vengeance of our God, because this is all about the good news that Jesus is coming. This is this purpose right here, right now. And he wants to be able to, to bestow on them, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. See, Jesus learned what he was to become and that his life was to be marked by sacrificial service, not fuzzy feelings, not passivity, not just attending on Sundays at the synagogue, but tangible actions that yielded changed lives. See, Jesus knew that he was serving his one and that that was going to require action. And in order to be able to do this well, he had to enter into the fray of life. He had to help those who were held captive by sin, not feeling like you have the power to actually change. Those who were captivated by shame, not feeling like I've lived up to the expectations of others. Who are captivated by guilt, knowing that deep down you've done wrong. He had to enter into those who've been burned by the chaos of, chaos of life, rejected by friends, the butt of mean jokes, hurt by divorce and death, challenged by lies in their own mind. I'm too fat, I'm too ugly, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not enough. Does that sound familiar? See, people don't normally look for beauty in the ruins. Normally, if you're damaged goods, you're no good. But God, but God. See, Jesus knew the potential in people. He knows the potential in you and me. He knows what he wants and what he created you to be able to receive, to give you life and life to the full. Do you remember that God made you for Eden? He didn't make you for this place. He wanted you to experience the fullness of life. Not the brokenness, the chaos, it's all going and culture's going to, in the handbasket, right? No, he didn't make you for that. He wanted you to be able to experience the fullness. That's what he wants for you. And so Jesus, Jesus learned that the Messiah was to become this carrier of hope, of healing, of restoration, of joy. See, the future is bright for Cibolo Creek, for San Antonio, for, our, for the world. If we partner with Jesus on his mission and join him, amen? Okay, we're awake a little bit, okay. So 
Like, look, we, we will spend time with Jesus and we will capture his heart. If we can capture his heart, we can become like him. We can be able to be empowered to be able to see the next movement, the next movement of God. And it won't be about us, right? Because the third section, the Messiah learns, guys, get this. The Messiah learns that it's not just him. It's not just about him. Because the subject of the sentence changes from me to they. And I wish that I had the right verse. So you're going to have to either look it up on your own or you're going to, so you can be with God and learn how to become like him. But this is what it says in Isaiah 61, verse four, it says this, there's this subtle change. And since you can't see, I want to tell you this, the whole passage from the very beginning, all it says is it talks about me. I will be, I will be, I will be. And then all of a sudden it turns and the next, the next stanza, it's all about they, it changes. Okay, you get that? It changes from the subject of the sentence changes from me to they because God wants to give good things. He says, they will be called oaks of righteousness. They will be the planting of the Lord for the display of God's splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. See, the Messiah was to invite other people to join in on the party. Jesus invited others to join in on the Messiah's mission to help spread the good news of God. And those who join him will be called oaks of righteousness. They will be unfazed by oak wilt. They will be like a mighty tree. They will be recognized by people all around. They will take something that was once great, now forgotten and restore it and remembering of all of its good, goodness and glory. And it's gonna be a challenging task. There will be pain and ashes and hurt and darkness, but it's worth it. With the spirit's power, they'll receive the kingdom of God. They'll receive God himself. They'll see cities renewed. They'll see land restored. And you know what? they'll be one step closer to what God originally intended, closer to Eden. See, God equipped Jesus through Isaiah 61 with his mission as Messiah. He knew that he needed to be with God. He knew that he needed to become a servant of God. And then he needed to invite others to do the same. And so after he rolled up the scroll of Isaiah, it's no wonder that Jesus begins his ministry by inviting followers, his disciples to join him. And in Matthew 4, 19, he ends up saying this. He says, hey, come, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It should be no surprise that this is exactly what Jesus does was at the beginning of his ministry. Because Jesus is gonna equip his disciples God equipped Jesus. Now Jesus knows what he's supposed to do. He knows how to run the play. And now he's going to run it. Here he is at the very beginning of his ministry. And then in Luke 4 through 9, what we end up seeing, I love Dr. Luke who wrote the book because he ends up identifying and seeing the complexity and the beauty of how Jesus intentionally carries out the Isaiah 61 plan. See, he equips his disciples with on-the-job disciple training. <laughs> That's really what he does. First, he does it, and then they watch it, and then they talk about it, and then they do it together, and then they talk about it. And then he says, okay, you do it, I'll watch, and then we'll talk about it. And then you know what he says? He says, hey, okay, you go do it with someone else, and then come back, and then we'll talk about it. It sounds like a business class, doesn't it? Yeah, guess what? It's a Jesus class. Welcome. They stole it from us. <laughs> like here, this is how we're supposed to do it. But this is exactly what Jesus does. Okay, get this. Okay, this part's cool. My geekiness is gonna come out. All right, so look, here we go. There are 240 villages in G Jesus visited in Galilee. And I'm thankful to my, my friend, Mac, who ended up teaching me this. See, there are 240 villages all throughout this area. And Jesus knew what his mission was. It was to go proclaim the good news, heal the sick and such, right? Okay, so Jesus, he takes three trips through the villages. In the first trip, he ends in Luke 4, he goes, and it's just him. One to 240, and there's a bunch of people following him. Well, that's a lot if you ask me. 
I don't know if I want to be responsible for 240 cities myself, but okay, here Jesus is. Well, then what does he do in lap two? In Luke 5 through 8, it describes Jesus' second trip. He begins equipping his disciples, taking them with him, teaching them to learn what it means to fulfill the great commission. So now he's not doing it alone, right? Okay, well, that was what Isaiah 61 was supposed to do. Now we bring other people along us, alongside us to be able to do the same mission. And he's teaching them. And then he sends them out. Okay, Luke 9, 1 through 6. Jesus sends his 12 back throughout the villages to do the same task. But this time he probably didn't go with them. He didn't go with them. And they probably divided up the villages and they executed the strategy that they saw Jesus do. Six teams of two. And then the ratio of teams of disciples to villages becomes one to 40. And then as they continue to fulfill because the spirit is upon them and they're starting to see the maturation of the kingdom of God and they're starting to see the fullness start to come to fruition, like then more people wanna be a part of the party. And Jesus is like, all right, let's bring them in. So now instead of 12, we have 72, 72 disciples who want to be able to go and proclaim the gospel, be a part of the advancing of the kingdom. And so Jesus, he divides them into two teams of two. So now we got a one to six ratio. Seems a little bit more manageable if you ask me, better than one to 240. So the span of care, of intentionality that Jesus is getting to is getting smaller, starts this big, but now it's bite size. The whole time Jesus is strategically equipping his followers and he's reaching the lost. And get this, even, okay, even after Jesus, he celebrates the fact that 72 people want to be able to follow him and be able to advance the kingdom, he implores them to pray. And this is what he tells them to pray. He says, look, the harvest is what? What is the harvest? Oh, come on. The harvest is, do you believe that? Okay, wait, hold on. I'm not sure I always do, but Jesus thinks it is. Jesus knows it is. Sometimes I think we forget that. Sometimes I think we're in a barren entity, (laughs) that it's desert. And it is hot here in San Antonio, but it is not a desert because even in the desert, beauty is seen all around us. Look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers, the workers, they're few. So this is what Jesus tells his disciples, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. When you look at this word of send out, it means pluck them up from their chair, pull them out because they got it in them and send them out into the field to be able to reap, to be able to be a part of the, of the process, a part of, of harvesting. Guys, this is what Jesus tells his disciples. And this is what Jesus is wanting for us today. So guess what? I've been praying for you. (laughs) I've been praying. We have been praying for you. We've been praying this for you, for us, that we would see the harvest be full and that we would be able to glean what God has given to us. And mind you, this is important. It's not just because Jesus wants a bigger church. It's not because Jesus just wants a bigger building. We have seen too much of that and that notoriety and all the rest. I'm not interested as much. I'm not interested in that. Let me say that more clearly. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is that people would be restored, that people would know the gospel, that people would be able to experience the beauty of what it knows. It is to be able to know Jesus that they would be able to experience the life change. That I know that Jesus has changed my life, taking me from something that is completely f- fearful, having to be someone in something, but because of what Christ has done, he set me free, told me I'm loved, that I'm cared for, and that I, it doesn't matter what I do, but instead it's who I am in him. I want people to be able to experience that fullness of what God has for us. Do you want that? See, it's because multiplying their efforts, multiplying their efforts is all a part of the plan. 
that God had in Isaiah 61. I love this too. Okay, so Jesus, he knows that Isaiah 60, uh, from, uh, he knows that Acts 2 is coming, right? He knows that he's planning and he's doing the playbook of, of Isaiah 61 because he knows that eventually he's gonna die, raise again, and that he's gonna send out his people. And guess what he's gonna give them? The Holy Spirit, the power, because he's not gonna be with them any longer. And so he's going to send the spirit because without the spirit, they don't have power. So what does he do? He ends up saying, all right, I gotta leave. It's better for me to leave than it is for me to stay. Crazy thing to think about the savior of the world. It's better for you to leave than for him to stay. And it is because he can send every single one of us, the Holy Spirit, to be able to live inside of us so that we can have the same power that Jesus had. You get that? Do you see how amazing that is? And then guess what happens? And then in Acts 2, what ends up happening is Peter, like, right, the whole Pentecost happens and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're talking with tongues and fire and all this crazy stuff that like us in traditional evangelical Christianity don't really want to talk about because we don't really know exactly what to do with it and we can't control it. But man, it was awesome. The move of God was amazing, right? And here it is. And now Peter, he's at the tabernacle. He's seeing all these people who are worshiping God. And he says, the Messiah has come. The, the Messiah that you killed. The Messiah, the one who was gonna take us back to Eden. He's here, he's risen. Death couldn't hold him. He rose again on the third day and now you could be able to experience the fullness of life, the forgiveness of your sin. No longer do you have to sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice has been given. And now all you have to do is be able to live and receive Jesus, repent from your sins, turn back to God receive him, follow him, learn how to be with him, learn how to become like him, learn how to do what he did, follow the Isaiah 61 plan. And 3,000 were baptized that day. Isn't that amazing? 3,000 people, okay, well, hey, well, what happens then is this, this is amazing part, is that we end up finding out <clears throat> that Jesus had prepared them, he had equipped them. And somewhere in here is that image that I'm gonna find, it's gonna be so good because guess what? And they, yeah, I found it. Okay, look, remember, he's prepared them. He's prepared them not for 100, one to 240, well, not one to six. When they have 3000 people come to faith in one day, they have a new believers class of one to 25. Totally doable. That's better than some of you teachers in your classes, isn't it? You're like, teachers are like, oh, if I could only. My mom was a teacher. She was like 40 people in her class. and oh, One to 25. <laughs> and here, here it is, right? So Jesus had prepared them to, he was equipping his people to multiply their efforts and to be able to fulfill the great commission. So now Jesus knows, he knows like, look, there's those disciples equipped other disciples and who equipped other disciples, who equipped other disciples. And guess what? We're here today being disciples, hoping to equip you. And so here it is that we are, what we are trying to do here. See, there's the things that we want to be able to do is to help you to be with Jesus. We want to help you to have constant connection with the King. Cause you have to know, like we, we gotta teach you, equip you to be able to, to carry out the Isaiah 61 plan. And so what does that look like? If we know why we're supposed to do it, if Jesus taught us how, well, what exactly are we supposed to be able to be being equipped and equipping others? Well, here's, here's what we are supposed to do. Like when you be with Jesus, our hope is to be able to equip you to be able to learn how to be before you do. And man, how difficult is that in, a, in, an, in an environment like this where we are so skilled, just being with God, sitting on a rock, listening and being with him. Yeah, that's not always easy for a whole bunch of overachievers like y'all, which I love by the way, but we gotta learn how to be able to be with God, to be able to seek him, and then to engage the Bible, both individually and corporately. And that's what we hope to be able to actually expand out to be with him and, and teach us in these key practices. 
And then as we become like him, if that's what it looks like to be with him, we want to become like him, to be able to have our heartbeat be like his heartbeat. And in order for that to happen, that means that we got to learn that we, there's some things that we're doing that aren't the way that God wants. That's called confession. And then we need to be able to give that up and choose to be able to do the things God wants. That's called repentance. Repentance. So we have to learn how to confess, how to be repentant. And then we need to learn how to be joyfully generous, not just materialistically, but also with our lives, how to give our life away. That's what Jesus did. That's what we ought to do. So we learn how to be, how to become, and then, then we need to learn how to be able to do what Jesus did how to actually share the gospel, to be able to serve, giving our life away and doing it together and how to accept opposition. Because when we actually do this, do you remember that Jesus died? Our King died. So we too ought to understand that we may face opposition and that's okay. Actually, the disciples because they were with God, knew his heartbeat and we were with him and then they had become so much like him that when they faced trials and they actually did the things that he was asking and they were beaten and such and thrown into jail in the book of Acts, they were like, man, how awesome is it that we have lived such a life that people know what we're about, that we would be counted faithful to be persecuted for him. And not just like said bad things. I mean, like they were beaten almost to death. That's, that's a big difference, right? And then to be able to, to learn, how do, how do we disciple other peoples? And so our hope here at Cibolo is to be able to help you, to be able to learn how to be, how to become, and how to do. And then here's, here, here's where I'm gonna, we're gonna end with here. Is that now, like they were almost ready. And in Acts 2, Jesus, when he sent the spirit, the spirit enabled them to do all of this. And so now well, here we are seeking to be able to equip you to be able to partner with the spirit to be able to bring about his kingdom here. And so there are two specific steps that we hope that as a church, we can take collectively and individually See, next week, we are going to two services. Next week, we are making room for your friends, but we're also, we're also inviting you to participate in the Great Commission, to take your next step. We're inviting you to do two things. The first is to invest in prayer. So if you have your phone, I want you to get it out. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to set an alarm for 10.02. At 10.02, I want you to pray Luke 10.2. At 10.02, I want you to pray that the Lord of the harvest, that he would be able to draw out people in our community and draw us to be able to go into the harvest and to, to reap, to be able to, to make a path, a way to be able to share not only Jesus, well, to share Jesus, not only him, but to also invite them into community. So we want you to be able to, at 10.02 a.m. and p.m., pray and ask that God would be help us as a church body to actually fulfill what, and participate in the Great Commission. So pray, okay? That's the first thing we're asking you to do. 10.02, we're gonna pray together. And then the second thing that we are wanting you to do is just invite your one. Like we can make all the space you want, but there's still empty seats. No one wanted to, well, thank you for sitting in the front row for us. <laughs> but there's still empty seats. There's still opportunity for you and me. So invite people. So pray that God would be able to place upon your heart that one person and then be so bold and so courageous to be able to invite them at either 9.30 or 11 to be able to be a part of that. Sound good? So your next step is first is to pray. And then the second is to invite. So let me pray for you and then we'll call it good. Hey, Jesus, thank you.
Holy Spirit, I pray and ask that you would empower us to be able to bring about your kingdom. I pray, God, that you would pour out your spirit upon us and that we would be able to, to be able to sense you and your love and that we would join you on your, your journey, your Isaiah 61 journey, that we would run the plan of being with you this week, that today we would take one more step to become like you and that we would do what you have done. And I pray specifically that you would help us to be able to invest by, in our church family by just praying for one another praying that you would open up doors, God. We ask that you would open up doors in our spheres of influence to be able to invite others to join us, to hear about your good news and your gospel. And we want that, to, not because we want a bigger building, but because we want more people to be able to be transformed by you. So God, please open up those doors and give our, our friend, my friends here boldness to be able to ask, hey, you wanna come? We got two services. Lord, we pray and ask for that. And then as they do so, Father, we pray that you would give us favor, that you would help us to be able to multiply, that we would see more, fill the seeds, but even more so that we would see lives changed. You've changed my life. You're changing this church. And we wanna become more and more like you. We wanna be found faithful to fulfill your great commission. We wanna live on mission, Jesus. So help us as we, Seek to be like you, to become like you, and to do what you did. Thank you, Father, for the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here. I'll be down here if you want to say hi, if, you, if this is your first time. But otherwise, let someone else know what time you're coming, and we'll see you later. <laughs>